Good evening and good morning to everybody. Um, I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about this work because I think it's, as Pierce told, I mostly work on uh, moments probability theory, but uh, another work of my work that gets up and I don't get much opportunity to talk about uh, theoretical statistics. So thanks for that. <laughs> okay, so today uh, the title of my today's talk is uh, adaptive estimation via optimal decision trees. And it's based on a recent work with uh, Sabir Saji Chatterjee, who's in the Department of Statistics in UIUC. Uh, so the primary motivation behind this work of ours came from this actually quite famous paper by David Donohoe, published in Annals of Statistics back in 1997. It's called curd and best orthogonal basis connection. So what he does here, uh, he introduces a methodology called the dyadic curd uh, as a non-parametric regression method for estimating uh, two-dimensional signals. So the card here, as usual, refers to classification and regression tree. But how is it different from CURT? Regular CURT is that while CURT, you know, you compute, uh, generally compute a locally optimal decision tree, you know, you, uh, make the locally optimal partitions so each state. Uh, for dyadic CURT, it computes a globally optimal dyadic decision tree, okay, based on solving a penalized least square optimization problem. And then what Donald shows in this uh, paper that uh, this estimator is minimax rate optimal of the class of bivariate functions, which show an isotropic smoothness. So if you think of it's like modulus of continuity, it follows different. So you can see it, uh, catch a glimpse of its hair. So it has like different folder exponent in different directions. Uh, now, of course, you know, you have to compute a globally optimal data decision tree, but it turns out that in this case, it's actually a uh, easy computation. You can compute it in linear times in the sample size. So then, uh, well, and we're working on some, uh, some I and my co-author, we're working on uh, some other methodologies and for estimating some not so in some non-parametric function classes. And then it occurred to us uh, that it might be uh, actually this idea, some extension thereof can be useful in actually estimating the class of functions that we're interested in, and some of which I list here. Uh, the first one, and probably I've mostly spent to just talk on that one, is the functions that are piecewise constant or piecewise polynomials with a, you know, a few pieces in general dimensions. Then uh, there's a class of function, or uh, essentially it's probably most uh, popular in two dimension, where um, the class of function consists of uh, images or matrices that have bounded variation. And a popular method uh, for estimating this class of functions is uh, so-called total variation denoising, or TV denoising. And then there's a class of, um, the, in dimension one, the functions uh, whose uh, who's some uh, higher order derivative, okay? So for example, for total variation, it's just, you can think of it like first order derivative is, um, uh, well, the function is uh, bounded variation and well, you can actually, you can actually uh, require the higher order derivative to have bounded variation instead of just the function itself, um, which requires some kind of integrability of uh, the bound on the, uh, the integral of uh, some higher order absolute uh, derivative. And a uh, popular method uh, methodology for estimating this class of functions is the so-called trend filtering. And what turned out from our work is that uh, not only does that occur offer similar you know, risk bounds as these methods, they actually sometimes offer better risk bounds and at the same time are computationally, computationally fast. And so, you know, hopefully in the, car, in the course of the talk, I'll be able to convince you of some of these merits. Uh, so for simplicity of exposition, I'll 
mostly focus on the class of functions that are constant on rectang pure rectangular pieces. But I hope to be able to give you enough hints and some slides to convince you that how actually the similar uh, estimates uh, give you good bounds and um, for the other classes of functions I mentioned here. Okay, so let's start with this, uh, the piecewise constant signals. And let me first describe the setup. This is uh, you know usual setup for um, non-parametric regression in, uh, in, in fixed design. So, well, our signal will be a d-dimensional array. So it's a, it's a function indexed by the d-dimensional grid of side length n. And what we observe is that, you know, the uh, signal with the noise, uh, sigma is the noise strength, and the entries of the noise array are mean zero and independent sub-Gaussian random variable. And uh, well, we measure the performance of an estimator by the usual mean squared error. That's the uh, average of the squared loss, expected squared loss over the sample size. So capital N is a little n to the word D, which is the sample size. Okay, and this norm is the usual equilibrium norm. Okay, that's the really standard setup. Uh, and how to define piecewise constant? Let's be precise. Uh, although this is probably quite obvious. Uh, so you define a rectangle to be, you know, as you can expect, it's the product of disjoint uh, D, not disjoint actually, it shouldn't be there, D discrete intervals. And um, rectangular partition of uh, such a rectangle, simply, you know, a collection of uh, rectangular subsets of this rectangle, whose union equals the whole set. And we call an array indexed by the d-dimensional grid to be piecewise constant if there exists a rectangular partition says so that this array restricted to each such rectangle, which I'll henceforth refer to as the blocks of the partition, is constant, okay? So define is this way. Well, every array is a uh, piecewise constant, right? Because uh, every vertex in uh, the d-dimensional grid is a rectangle. So that's why it makes sense uh, to be, to talk about, uh, to, to introduce this functional called KL theta star, which is essentially the cardinality of the minimal, the coarsest rectangular partition that you can define, says that theta star is constant on the blocks of pi, okay? That's the natural definition. And we call theta star to be piecewise constant with K pieces if uh, the scale theta star equals K. So that's it. Uh, if you have any question about the setup, just let me know. Okay, so now how to estimate such class of functions? Well, if somebody told you, you know, let's say your oracle, that exactly the partition, you know, say exactly what the blocks are, then, well, you'll just do the trivial thing. You'll uh, just go to each of this block and feed the average, okay? Because that should be the least square estimate. And this will give you, like, standard, as we all know, like using the standard methodologies, that it uh, this estimate will incur a sigma squared times KL theta star over N as an MSC. Okay, but of course we don't know that. And um, then usually, actually, this is not far from the, actually the minimax uh, rate for this class. Uh, actually using uh, information theoretic arguments, you can show that uh, the minimax rate for this class of functions is actually uh, this, what you see here, sigma squared times k over n times a log factor, okay? Actually, you know, this follows from the same result for uh, signals that are k sparse actually. So because, you know, well, you know, the signals that are k sparse, you can, there actually you can easily show that it's contained in the class of signals uh, that have at most, let's say, some constant times k pieces, and hence it follows. Okay. So now, what is our objective? Uh, we intend to obtain an uh, estimator in all dimensions that satisfies these two properties. The first, it attains this minimax red rig bound or sigma square k all over n times log n adaptively for theta star. What I mean by adaptive is that, well, okay, you do not focus know the true partition or what is the cardinality of the, this course's partition, but it risk will automatically affect uh, 
automatically reflect, um, automatically attain this uh, the minimax rate for for the for the class of signals of that number of pieces. And second, it should be computable. Of course, you can go around and search over all possible partitions, but that's not very practical. We want to be able to compute it in polynomial time at least in the sample size. Now, before this work, so, uh, so here the Oracle, uh, so the block partition is not known. No, 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 no. So nothing is known. Yeah, you don't know K, you don't know the partition, nothing. Yeah, yeah, you just have that. Uh, so before this work, you know, um, these types of problem, well, similar flavor have been have been studied with other estimators based on convex optimization. So one of them is, uh, the, as I told you, and I'll actually talk a bit probably in the course of the talk, is called total variation denoising. And that we and my co-author studied in a different paper. Uh, and there's a slight variation of that called the Hardy cross variation denoising, which is essentially a bit, uh, tweaking the definition in the discrete setup. Uh, that was studied by Ortheli and Vendor Gear in 2019 and Fang, Gunjo Goina, and Sain in 2020. And none of them actually, actually, we could, in our paper, we proved that, you know, you cannot obtain better. So the rate was like k to the power three over four, sorry, k to the power some power, like bigger than one over n to the power three over four. Okay? And you cannot do, we proved that you cannot do better than that. Here, actually, orthogonal vendor gear achieved one over n rate, but the dependence on k is suboptimal. It was actually, as far as I know. Um, so, so far, to the best of our knowledge, before our work, these questions uh, have not been rigorously answered in the literature, in the machine learning or statistics literature. And so, you know, I hope to be able to propose a solution uh, in the course of this talk. So, okay. uh, do, so do you learn a partition as well? Sorry. Sorry, there's a question from Sandeep, uh, which is, uh, do you learn the partition as well? Like, so do you just learn? Uh... Oh, uh, yeah, I learned the partition as well, yes. Yeah. Uh, but, okay, we don't put a metric on that. Our loss function doesn't reflect that, but I, I, I'll describe the estimator shortly. Yeah. Any other? Okay. okay. So let me now define the curve. okay? And let me define it and I'll then state the main results. So in order to do that, let me define how we call here the dyadic recursive dyadic partition. So let me define a small a move called dyadic split. So take a rectangle. So I have drawn a doodle here with my inefficient hand. Uh, hopefully this does because I don't have an iPad actually. Uh, so a dyadic split of a rectangle is simply you choose one of its uh, these sides, and you just split it into half, okay? And then you take one of the rectangles to obtain and apply the same, you know, apply the same split, okay? And you go on iteratively, because it'll be with this specific, okay? So generating finer and finer partitions, and all the partitions that you can get using such splits in iterative fashion uh, will be called a recursive dynamic partition. Okay, so that's the definition. For example, here, so this procedure, it's, this is a recursive dynamic partition. Okay. Uh, just for convenience, uh, I'll be denote I'll denote the set of all recursive dynamic partitions of the D-dimension grid to be calligraphic P R D P D N, or since the D and N will be mostly fixed throughout the talk, simply denote them as calligraphic P R D P. Now consider the following minimal partitioning uh, optimization problem. So what you do is that you just take uh, the squared loss uh, penalized by the cardinality of the partition uh, times the tuning parameter lambda, non-negative tuning parameter lambda, and you look at the partition uh, which minimizes that. Okay. So I, of course I have to explain to you the meaning of pi y, but probably you have already guessed is essentially the orthogonal projection of the observation metri matrix or vector, if you see them as an element of Rn, onto the subspace of uh, matrices um, that are constant on the blocks of this partition phi. Or more simply, even simpler words, uh, uh, it's, just, uh, it's just the matrix that you obtain 
by uh, assigning to every block of pi um, the average value of y over that block. Okay, it's simply that. Now let me just take this opportunity to describe like how we adapt it for a piecewise polynomial. So there, you know, essentially you're um, essentially you have a family of functions. In case in this case here is just constant function, just one. In that case, we do have uh, different basis like uh, uh, polynomials of degree at most r, right? You have some basis functions, and you will just regress in each block. You will just regress uh, on those functions, okay, into a linear combination on those functions. That's what you will do. That's the immediate way to generalize this. Okay, so it just works uh, verbally, and uh, so that's the optimal partition phi hat R D B lambda, and the estimator is uh, essentially uh, the observation vector averaged uh, over each blocks uh, of this optimal partition. Okay, so this produces a piecewise constant array on the partition phi hat optimal partition. Uh, okay, of course you minimize it over the class of recursive dyadic partitions. And this is exactly, precisely the dyadic curve distributor I was talking about that was proposed by Donovo in dimension two. Okay, is the definition clear to everyone? Okay. Anyways, uh, and I'll probably take some time later to argue, uh, to explain to you, but let me just state it here. Uh, this optimization problem, you can solve at most linear in all the uh, basic, uh, time, uh, basic operations by dynamic programming. Okay, it's quite easy actually to show that. Okay, so that's your estimator, the definition. Now let's come to the risk bound. Uh, so for that, in order to phrase that, I have to define this side alteration of the functional k of theta, right? That I defined for you earlier. So it's a similar thing is again, the cardinality of the minimal partition, uh, the number of blocks in the minimal partition says that theta is constant on the blocks of phi, except that now you do this minimization over the class of recursive dyadic partitions, okay? Uh, so evidently, since it's more constrained, it's, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, it's uh, it's clear that this KRDP theta is bigger than KL theta, okay? And we'll come to that issue, but let's put, keep that in mind. Uh, so with that definition, now let me state the risk bound, which is the oracle response for Diane Kurt. So if you choose a tuning parameter to be like absolute constant, which you can precisely estimate, times sigma squared times log n, then, the following holds that MSC is bounded by um, well, what we can see here. I think I don't, I don't read that, but uh, let me help you to interpret this. So suppose, uh, forget that KRDP theta is actually bigger than KL theta. So let's say theta star, your true signal, has uh, you know is a constant on the blocks uh, of a dyadic partition with k blocks. Okay, let's assume that. So it's not only just any partition, the pieces, they're also, they also form a, dyadic, a recursive dyadic partition. Then you just, you know, plug uh, theta equals theta star here, if there is an infimum in this, in this bound, this disappears. So what you get actually is a lambda times, you know, the number of pieces over n, okay? So that really looks like, you know, what we're aiming for, except that, you know, the true signal has to be in the, has to be constant on the blocks of a recursive dyadic partition instead of any partition. Um, right, so, um, okay, so where do we stand on? Now let's, let me try to address the issue that KRDB theta can be B compared to KL theta. Okay, so how big can that be? How big can KRDB theta be compared to KL theta? It turns out, and actually it's not particularly difficult, it's a simple combinatorial exercise. In dimensions one and two, you can refine any partition, okay? You can refine any partition into a recursive dyadic partition by, um, by increasing the number of blocks by a polylogarithmic factor, okay? So C log n to the power of D. So what this means in the context of the bound, theoretical bound that I just presented to you is that uh, under our choice of lambda, in dimensions one and two, 
you our this estimate recursive uh, this uh, that curve attains the rate uh, we're aiming for, except that uh, well, except that the cost of a few uh, full logarithmic factor log into the over t. Okay, the true rate will be log n. Okay, okay, so we are quite close, but you know, and it's computation efficient, so that's not bad. But still, it would be good, of course, to get the true rate, like if you attain the minimax optimal rate, optimal minimax rate. And of course, we would like to do it for all dimensions, at least for low or moderate dimensions. So to fix that, let me present a slight extension, slight modification of this, uh, this estimator, which you call optimal regression tree. So what we'll do here is that we'll extend the class of partitions from recursive dyadic partitions to what you call here hierarchical partitions. So let me define that for you. And again, there is a doodle if that's helpful at all. Uh, so what you do here, again, uh, so there is a move, it's uh, called here, it's called split, where you take a rectangle, unlike before, and accept, and you choose one of its sides, let's say this one. Now, contrary to the, the dyadic partition, here, actually, you can choose the partition. You can choose it to split along any point. Okay, so it's one of the endpoints, little endpoints, instead of just the middle point. Okay, so the split produces two rectangles, which may not be of equal size. Okay, and then you just repeat the procedure with the rectangles that you so often. Okay, and to by and keep on generating finer and finer partitions, and any partition that you can obtain by a sequence of such moves, you call a hierarchical partition. And so, you know, hierarchical partition, essentially, if you think about it, it parallels the evolution of a decision tree. Okay, that's essentially a decision tree. You know, if you think of it as a space of predictor variables, you're splitting your space in every step uh, into two parts and trying to get at some partition. So that's what you're doing. Okay, so that's hierarchical partitions. Hopefully that definition is clear. Uh, again, of course, uh, it's still better than, uh, you know, it's still more general than dyadic part recursive dyadic partitions, but still not all, the, doesn't cover all the partitions. So here are some three pictures I put up. I don't know how helpful they'd be. Uh, the first one, okay, I'll just leave you to verify for yourself. Uh, it's a recursive dyadic partition. The second one is hierarchical partition. But not a recursive, uh, not a um, dyadic one. Actually, you can confirm that by using that split. But what is more clear actually is that this partition is a partition, of course, but it's a rectangular partition, but it's not hierarchical. And that's easy to see because if you, from the definition, you have to have, you've got to have at least one split that spans left to right or top to bottom, which you don't see yet. Okay. Again, but well, we probably don't care that much about whether every partition it's a hierarchical partition as long as it admits of a refinement into a hierarchical partition without incurring too much in terms of the number of blocks. And I'll come to that shortly. But before that, let me define the estimator, and it's just similar except that you would simple class. So again, let's call calligraphic P3 to be the class of you know the set of all hierarchical partitions of the grid. And then uh, we define the estimator in a similar way to be the partition optimizing this penalized least square, uh, penalized square. Um, but now you look for the minimum in the class of all decision trees, okay, or all hierarchical partitions. And you define uh, the corresponding estimator. That's what we call an optimal regression tree estimator or the estimator. Again, uh, so what is the competition complexity? And I'll explain to you that uh, after a while. Uh, well, of course, you incur a bit more cost, but not too much. It's uh, in the sample size is uh, square, two plus one over t, basic operations. So it's still not too bad. It's quite good, actually. Okay. And yeah, again, this uh, generalizes very naturally uh, if you wanted to, uh, to fit piecewise polynomial. Uh, instead of piecewise constant. Okay, now let me present the analogous Briggs bound. It's almost similar, except now your functional, this 
k theta is now k three theta, which is a similar thing, the minimum number of blocks in the partition in which uh, your theta is piecewise constant, blockwise constant, except that now the minimum is over all hierarchical partitions. Okay. So since hierarchical partitions contain recursive ionic partitions, you definitely have that. This k3 theta is sandwiched between uh, these two k all theta and k r dp theta. And you have a similar bound, just like before, except that k r dp theta being replaced by k3 theta. Okay, so very, very fine. But now, how does it solve the problem that it was designed to address, right? Uh, because we wanted to address the discrepancy between k r dp theta and k all theta. Let's see how does this one fare. In that regard, here we are a bit luckier. And here let me invoke some results from computational geometry from early 90s and early 2000s. So what happens that, well, in dimension one, for the first of all, uh, although in dimension one has been done before, so, but just let me say, it, any dimension is a hierarchical dimension, uh, partition. This, so the problem is really there for high dimensions. Okay. In dimension two, uh, this is a result by Barman and co-authors from 2002, which says that uh, any partition uh, admits of in dimension two admits of a refinement uh, into a hierarchical partition, whereas number of blocks increases by a factor of at most two. Okay, so that means in view of our the result in the previous slide, uh, at least for d equals two, and of course for d equals one, for our choice of lambda, we get this rate that we were aiming for. Okay, so as things stand now, we have achieved using this WRT our obje both objectives because it's also computable. Okay, I have to prove that. I have to probably convince you, but if you believe me, uh, it's also efficiently computable in a sense, and you know it attains the minimax rate. Uh, adopted. Okay, so for d equals to two, we have achieved our goals with the single estimator. What about other dimensions, uh, higher and more dimensions? They are actually, it's uh, a bit, uh, okay, we need to assume a bit more, but still not too much. So what you have to assume is that the partition is regular enough. The blocks of the partition are not too thin which means that the aspect ratio, which is simply the ratio of the maximum side length over the minimum side length, is not too big. They're not too big. So we call a rectangular partition uh, to be alpha fat, where alpha is a parameter bigger than or equal to one, to be um, uh, to be alpha fat if all its blocks have aspect ratio bounded by alpha, okay? So that's a reasonable assumption, not too bad. Now, if you grant me that, then there's a result with Debar from 1995, it says that for any alpha fat partition, partition in any dimension, it admits of a refinement into a hierarchical partition whose number of blocks increases by a factor which depends at most on the dimension and of course on alpha. So if you're true, if you're the, the rectangular level sets of your true signal are all alpha fat, okay, which is not a big bad assumptions to make, I guess, then uh, it is indeed true that uh, we also attain in all dimensions uh, the minimax rate, okay? Our estimators also we are able to obtain both of our objectives. Okay, if you have any questions, I can stop, but let me take some time to summarize I mean, results before I go to computation and a bit about other things. So what we have is that the dyadic curve attains the respond, k all over n times polylog in log n uh, for all theta star in dimensions one and two. Then uh, optimal regression tree actually attains the minimax rate in dimensions two and of course in one. It continues to attain this 
uh, minimum uh, this improved reads bound uh, in higher dimensions, as long as your true signal is regular enough, like it's all level sets are fat. And uh, the dyadic card is computable in linear time, whereas ORT is computable in uh, n to the word 2 plus 1 over t. Uh, that's many basic operations. Okay, so that's actually what we have gotten so far. Okay, so let me now tell you why actually uh, these uh, very briefly argue, try, try to argue to you why uh, it attends, uh, you know, the, uh, this uh, rates of computer, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, the complexities I, I mentioned. So, and it's basically because of the, you know, nature of the additive nature of the objective function, which allows for a dividing of concrete principle. So let me define for any rectangle R, okay, a uh, version of this problem restricted to R, which is simply, you know, you define the same problem, except that now you are looking at the partitions of the rectangle and the vector, the observation array restricted to R. Then it's quite easy to see from the nature of the objective function that your problem R is, can be computed in this way. So from, uh, you know, you take uh, the optimum minimum over all non-trivial splits of the rectangle and you uh, compute uh, the value of the problems for each of the separate tangles, and you obtain the one for which it's minimum. Okay, that's it. So what it means is that, you know, if we have this, if we can compute the value of the problem for each rectangle R, then of course I can go top down and compute the optimal regression, uh, sorry, the optimal partition, and as well as uh, the value of the estimate very easily. And how do you compute that, uh, this rectangle for each, each one, okay. And that you do in a bottom-up fashion. So, okay, you start from rectangles of size one, okay. And then you move up, move up uh, in terms of the size of the rectangles, okay. And what you do, well, you know, once you know, let's say for a given rectangle, where you want to compute the optimal split, as well as the value of the problem, you already know that the value of the problem for rectangles of lower orders, so you can essentially what you have to do, you have to actually do a comparison involving uh, all the such possible partitions, all such what possible splits. And then let me remind you how many are there. Well, for each side, let's say I'm talking about optimal regression tree, okay? The hierarchical partitions. Well, in each side, you just do at most little and many. So there are D sides, so little and times D many. So that's why this terms come from, okay? That's all, okay? And you have to do that for every rectangle. And how many rectangles are there? Well, that's very easy to compute that just capital N squared, right? Because essentially you have to obtain an interval in each dimensions and the number of intervals you know, in, each in each side is at most little n squared. So you take to the power of D, you get capital N squared. Okay, so that gives you this capital N squared times little n. So recalling the little n is essentially capital N to the power one over D, you get the rate uh, I just described. Okay, and why is it better? Why is it better for uh, dyadic curve? And the thing is that there, the number of comparisons at each step is actually of order of constant, right? Because they're actually, you know, the split is dyadic. So essentially given a site, there is exactly one split. So there are a constant number of splits. So this goes away, and there also you are constrained to only dyadic rectangles, and you can convince. And there's a very easy argument to prove that the number of dyadic rectangles, sub so rectangles of dimensional lattice of size little n, is essentially order of capital n. Okay, so that gives you linear order. So that explains how actually you would compute this estimate. Hopefully, I was probably I was a bit too fast, but hopefully I could convince you. Okay, now let me uh, take some time uh, to explain at least uh, how this results, you know, how these estimators also continue to perform well for at least one other interesting class of functions, namely that of uh, bounded variation functions in 2D. 
although in our paper we consider uh, more general classes uh, in all dimensions and more general type of functions but let me uh, focus into that so let us recall or probably uh, is what does the class consist of so uh, we define the total variation uh, for two-dimensional metrics to be uh, essentially the sum of the differences of the matrix along all the edges of the grid, normalized by little n, and this normalization is done so that if you imagine this theta used to be a relation, you know, of a smooth function on the unit square on a regular uh, grid, a separation one over n, then this is exactly what we need to do, you know, uh, that is exactly what you need to how you need to normalize it so that it gets comparable to the total variation of that function as a smooth smooth function of unit square. Okay, that's what it is. I think also that you know, uh, so you'd expect that to be constant for boundary condition functions. Okay, and a very popular estimator, as I hinted earlier in the talk, in for estimating this class of functions, is the so-called total variation denoising estimator. Just uh, introduced in the context of image denoising, of course. And it was in a very famous paper by Rudin in 1992. So what does the estimator do? Is that it uh, just, uh, uh, you know, you consider the penalized, uh, the estimate, the penalized estimator where the penalty term consists of the total variation of theta, okay? Multiplied by a uh, tuning parameter. That's what you do. And a form of this estimator, that's what we consider in our early paper. And as I told you, this doesn't seem to attain the objectives, objectives that we uh, laid out for us uh, for this work. Okay. Uh, now, what about this class is that, um, okay, but however, this TVD denoising estimator, although it doesn't add up nicely, it does attain the minimax rate, you know, uh, so the slow, uh, the minimax rate for uh, the class of functions was total variation is bounded by, say, some number capital V. And this was shown in this works by Hunter Rigole, 2016, and then Southern Ala and his co-office in, in the same year. And that's essentially, um, the rate is V over square root of N up to log factor. And actually, well, probably I'll be able to convince you why this the rate comes uh, actually, uh, I think using our estimator, but anyways. Uh, okay, so this is uh, the minimax rate up to Paul log factor. And here is our result for diary part. Uh, we just apply the same, so there's no problem, right? Uh, because the estimator doesn't, doesn't assume anything about the number of pieces or anything of that sort. So if you use the estimator to estimate uh, for this class, you attain this rate, actually. Okay. Uh, so let me try to convince you how, how actually you get it uh, briefly. So let us just recall, you know, here I just recall the bound that we get for that part, okay? So that's actually the bound. Okay, so now what we'll do, unlike in the case where, you know, theta star has a few pieces like K pieces, now I will not do that. Now we will really take advantage of this interval. So what we will do is that, well, we'll use the fact this the total variation of theta star is bounded by V star to be able to obtain some kind of approximation, some approximation of a in terms of a matrix theta that has uh, quite a few, you know, few number of pieces, okay? So I'll approximate it by um, a matrix, uh, it's a piecewise constant matrix with a few, uh, depending on, of course, V, the parameter, few number of pieces. Then I'll just approximate it by that. So what will I incur is that two, com two parts, one part would be the number of pieces here of that matrix with which you approximate and then the approximation. And both of them actually for this matrix would be of the order of like, uh, uh, essentially V times, okay, V over N, if you define V a different way, but V over square root of N. Okay. Both of these will give you the same term, which actually uh, is similar to this. Okay, so I'll just not go to any details, but let me just tell you what we do is that, um, here is what, how it looks like. So what you do, you take uh, such a matrix, let's say you have theta, okay? Whose uh, total variation is, uh, is uh, 
is a bit different definition. Okay, remember, uh, well, I multiplied by n so that now it's just this normalizing factor is gone. Okay, it's so simply the sum of the h differences. Anyways, whatever. So what you do is that you start with the signal, uh, this matrix, and you go in a greedy fashion, okay, uh, by uh, dyadically splitting by uh, uh, splitting your matrix into parts until you arrive at a partition. Again, you will often you will arrive there by means of uh, dyadic split. So that partition would be a recursive dyadic partition, you know, as you require here uh, for, the, for the obtaining the bound. But what will happen is that what will ensure is that within each of the block of this partition that we arrive at, the total variation of theta, okay, would be small, smaller than delta. Delta is some small number that we'll choose, that we'll choose, but forget about that. So that's a one, one over two or whatever, okay? And you can ensure that if you do that, it's quite easy to show that the number of partitions of such a matrix, you know, is just the super additive property of total variation functional, okay? It's very simple. Uh, you can show then using that, the number of blocks would be at most V over delta, okay? Otherwise, the total variation of the matrix theta would exceed V. Essentially, that's the reasoning, uh, probably missing by a factor of log n. And, okay. And now what happens is that within each such block, your total variation is at most delta. That's by definition, that's such condition, that stopping condition. Then actually you can use a discrete version of Gagliardo Nierenbach inequality to say, which says that, well, if you then simply approximate theta by its average value in each of these blocks, uh, this L2RR that you incur, total L2RR is at most V times delta, okay? Actually what you incur in each such block is delta squared. It's total variation is square, okay? That's basically Gagliardo Nierenbach, what that would give you. And then you just multiply it over because it just, you know, you sum it over all blocks, over that many blocks, you get V delta, as simple as that. Okay, so you just sum them over here, okay? And you get the V over square root of time, as simple as that. So that's the proof in a sense. There's a question about the motivation for the total variation. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so, you know, uh, well, it's a very, well, I think, you know, in two-dimensional images, you can imagine, uh, you know, it, for example, um, it is very a good, uh, so for example, the piecewise constant functions, you can imagine like an image, you know, there are some, it consists of fewer homogeneous pieces, okay, within each piece, you have incurred very low total variation, and only things will come from the con contribution of the boundary, and that will actually lead you uh, this kind of functions to be a bounded total variation, okay? And this is a, and also this is a very fam uh, popular class of functions with anisotropic smoothness, actually. First, uh, yeah, you'd look at this kind of thing. So you can think in a might like, you know, if you have, it consists of some homogeneous, fewer homogeneous blocks, that is actually not a very unreasonable assumption if you think in terms of image or something like that. And then actually this actually will have a bounded variation, total variation. Uh, and it's a very popular technique for image design. Okay. Uh, how many time do I have left? I think very few, four minutes, right? Or, okay, so let me just try to probably give us very brief sketch of the proof. And this will be probably, okay. And it's quite standard, you know, from those who are in empirical process theory, I think, but for others probably it might be interesting. So what you do is that you just observe that uh, this, uh, both of these estimators, in for both of our estimators, uh, you can uh, uh, think of the parameter space to be a union of subspaces, okay? So a, fi a union over a finite collection of subspaces. So what do I mean is that, what should you think of as, uh, well, for our cases, let's say, you know, in dyadic card, uh, one of such a subspace will correspond to one particular partition or in the hierarchical, in, even in the ORT it would, it would uh, correspond to a partition in the respective class. And uh, what is a subspace? First, this is obvious, is a class of all, is a subspace of all matrices or arrays, sorry, that are constant in the blocks of that partition, right? That forms a subspace. So that's your parameter space. So then uh, both of our estimators are special 
for cases of the penalized disco estimator, where you, you know, penalize um, L2 distance from theta with a tuning parameter times case theta. And what is case theta? Case theta is basically your this functions of the you know, versions of the functions, functionals k all theta or k r d p theta or k tree theta. Okay. So what they all are is essentially the minimum dimension of a subspace uh, in your collection of subspaces, calligraphic S, that contains that signal. Okay. So you know, so if you have uh, k pieces, then it's exactly k. Okay. If the minimal partition contains k pieces, then it's k. Okay, so that's the way to set it up. Uh, and one other thing, actually, theoretical assumption, and which is important for deriving our bound, and which is true in this case, is that uh, this kind of entropy bound, which is that uh, the cardinality, the number of subspaces with a given cardinality k is bounded by lit capital. And this is a very blunt bound, actually, for our crude bound. And it's very easy, right? I mean, you can convince yourself very easily that it's true because the number of rectangles you have to partition it at most k parts into each side, that is little n to the power k, and you do it in all the, so you multiply d times. So anyways, it's much better than that. Okay, but that's enough. With all the assumptions, uh, like I said in the previous slide, we have for this general class of problem, the following Higgs bond. Now, which you can immediately recognize how it corresponds, how from this, you know, we can obtain our two response. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So let me just give you a brief hint. Uh, how is it done? Okay. I'll not bore you much. So for this, let's assume that your noise entries are all Gaussian. Stand, okay. Gaussian. Well, you do the obvious thing is that, okay, you use the fact that theta hat is the minimizer of this, uh, of this object of this function. It's, uh, so you just use that and you expand, you substitute y, um, theta star plus sigma z for y and expand. Just do standard manipulation, okay? Ex after expanding the squares and you get these two terms. So the first time you can recognize that it just only involves some theta, some this uh, theta, it doesn't involve theta hat at all. So you can take an interim over that. And the second term, which for which actually, so this will contribute to this term. And the second term is what for which you need to obtain this you know, sigma square, this constant, this constant time sigma square of orbit. And actually, it turns out to be convenient to have this normalized. So that's why you do some trivial, like standard manipulation to come up with a quarterly version of that. Don't bother. So essentially, there's a quarterly kind of version of that. So that's what you have. That's actually what you want to bond. Uh, where the bond means normalized. Okay. Um, well, why would you expect this to work, right? Why would you expect this to be? Well, this is a linear, you know, extremal, you know, this is a kind of like extremum of a functional, a linear functionals uh, of Gaussian variables. So you have standard theories. So here, here, is, here is what you do. But there is still annoying theta hat, but you, you don't care. You just write it in a double, uh, like triples. You just do a supremum over all possible choices. So in particular, you take a supremum over so you, you know, fix one of the dimensions, you take maximum over dimensions, you take maximum over all subspaces that you, lies in your collection, you know, that contain theta hat, that have dimension K, and then you take the supremum over all vectors in that subspace, okay? So it's evident, bluntly smaller than that. And why would you expect this to be all we had? And how, what is the role playing there? This comes from this, and you can actually check it. It's, it's by basic uh, linear algebra and Cauchy squares inequality. You actually can show that it's very easy to show that uh, using the you know, quadratic forms of variables that this expected value of this quantity is square root of dimensions. So the square of this behaves like the dimension of the cardinality, which really balances this thing, right? So which is will be balanced, offset by this factor k appearing here. And then this is the only place actually in this here, actually I use uh, Gaussian concentration equality, you just can use uh, that to go to a tail bound around its expected value. Okay, that's okay. So we still have two supremums to take care of. Well, you just take a double union bound. That's what you do. Some, and then you take uh, NKS. Remember, NKS is basically this thing, the number of subspaces of a given dimension. Okay. And here, actually, this, this thing, is coming into going to come into play, and you will see how the why actually we should choose lambda as 
I state in the set it in the in the result. So well, just recall that I can log of NKS by our assumption is n to the power k. Um, sorry, NKS is n to the power k. So you took the log, so it becomes like little k times log n. So you incorporate that, you subsume that within the exponential. And what you have to beat it this term. So this will introduce a k log n term. You only have this lambda k term to beat it. And you really want to beat it. Then it's just not. You just do an integrate and voila, there you go. So for that, you can easily see that your lambda, OK, when you subsume it, it will give you a term like k sigma square log n. Your lambda has to be bigger than c sigma square log n, just to beat it. And there you go. So that's. That's the origin of the lambda, nothing more mysterious than that. Uh, so just I conclude, uh, I think I have taken already more time. So there is an open question, which is I'll just keep everything that we still like you know, the lambda difference of sigma square. It's still desirable to obtain lambda and to do, come up with some version so that we can choose lambda in a data-driven way. And that's actually the subject matter of our ongoing work. Um, okay, so thank you for your attention. Uh, I'll stop here. So, are there any questions? So, uh, so, 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 just one question. So, so, you said sub, so there's some simple comparison after this to go to sub Gaussian from there. So, uh, I'm sorry. So, there's some simple comparison to go from here to the sub Gaussian. So, so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sub Gaussian actually. So, the only place I use Gaussian here is uh, here I use. But you can actually, have, uh, you can do again for, for sub Gaussians, you yeah. essentially have quadratic functions, uh, forms involving Z, and you can use uh, standard like, uh, you know, like metric and topic bound and to, mm -hmm. you know, standard like a chaining, uh, like, like a yeah. bound to often similar bounds. So that's not a problem. It's just mm -hmm. makes it simpler. Yeah. And there's a question about, there's a question from Himachandra about uh, the motivation for the sub Gaussian noise. Well, it's uh, well. I mean, you know, sub Gaussian actually uh, encompasses a lot of things. You know, uh, much larger class of variables potentially you can imagine. Or, uh, but well, one thing is that you know we could do it. So that's I think a uh, thing. And uh, well, you know, you can imagine probably in many cases. Uh, well, even if you are in some cases, I don't know, like binomial or binomial or uh, mm -hmm. which are all sub Gaussian. Uh, Everything just works vis a vis. So, yeah. so it's with some some somewhat heavier tail things would take place. Oh yeah. So okay. Yeah. So from other yeah. For yeah. So from yeah. If you have a weird tail behavior, then actually yes, uh, things will be different. I think. Yeah. Okay. There things will be different. Uh, also, so, also the you know, the depend. So as if I remember correctly, everything was for d equal to two, and that is because of this. Uh, well, if you want to connect to the full k all then. Everything has to be done. Uh, so this, uh, so for this, this CD alpha thing puts in some arbitrary dependence upon the dimension. Ah, uh, yeah. So right. So that's um, I agree. Yes. So that thing actually might actually even depend exponentially on d, mm -hmm. probably. So that's the thing. So that's why probably this actually. Uh, that's why I say I should. Uh, for moderate, moderate and low dimensions, mm -hmm. uh, it's quite well. For, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, otherwise, yeah. But that's the only place which is badly dimension dependent. Precisely, precisely. Uh, otherwise, actually, in the computation terms, also you have at most linear actually. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Dependence in the constants. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But for yeah, in the dimension terms. Yeah. 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 No more questions. Let's thank uh, Swishes once more. Thank you. And uh, we'll. Uh, yeah, and we'll uh, uh, join in another five minutes. So at uh, 7.31 again, IST. Thanks. Thank you.